I just want to thank you all for being here for the first ever UNK LGBTQ com Community Research and Community yeah. Symposium. I'm just going to put this down. Okay, I can see you. Okay, this event is being held to bring awareness and education about the experiences of people who identify as LGBTQ in our area. For the healthcare professionals here today, we hope the symposium will help build your knowledge and confidence in reaching out to the LGBTQ population and effectively working with them to meet the, their healthcare needs. For the students, staff, and community members here today, we hope you'll gain an understanding of the barriers our LGBTQ community members face and become a stronger ally for them but also be able to recognize the resilience and determination they have in their daily lives. For everyone here today, we hope this visibility will facilitate a broader hope and acceptance of the LGBTQ people in our community. I'd highly recommend that you all stay for the entire day. We have a day packed full of vitally useful information planned for you. You are at the CEU session one entitled Anxiety, Depression, and the LGBTQ Community, Thriving Through the Challenges, presented by Dr. Deb Hope. Dr. Hope received her PhD in clinical psychology from Albany State University of New York in 1990 and joined the Department of Psychology at UNL that same year. Her current research interests follow two broad themes, assessment and treatment of anxiety disorders, particularly social anxiety disorder, the impact of stigma and discrimination on That's mental tough. health care services, particularly for individuals who identify as LGBTQ. Dr. Hope is the director of the Anxiety Disorders Clinic and the Rainbow Clinic, both specialty services with the UNL Psychological Consultation Center. Her work on psychopathology in social anxiety disorder and the impact of these cognitive processes on interpersonal functioning. Dr. Hope also has ongoing research on both the outcome and process of psychotherapy, with the most recent emphasis on using technology to make evidence-based treatment more available, especially in underserved rural areas. Her LGBTQ research is focused on examining how stigma and discrimination affect mental health. Her current major collaboration is developing a culturally sensitive model of care for individuals who identify as transgender and reside in areas with few specialty resources. Dr. Deb Hope is doing amazing and great work, and I really appreciate her. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Deb Hope. All right, thank you very much, Don. Um, how are we doing on volume? Okay, all right. I'm watching the live streaming folks back here. Everybody can hear okay? All right, I'm very, very pleased to be here um, today, and I appreciate your warm introduction, Don. Through some of the research that we've done, I've gotten to know Don and the work that she does, and I'm sure many of the people in this room are aware of the extraordinary uh, work she does with these communities and. Um, her sort of commitment um, in her practice to um, serving people who, who often don't get the best services. So um, I, I refer her to regularly and um, urge you all to do so as well. Um, I'd also like to um, thank Patrick Arnold and the uh, folks um, who organized this. This is, looks like an amazing day. Unfortunately, I have to run back and do something at my other job, so I will not be able to stay, but um, uh, it looks like really an, an amazing um, set of talks. I also want to acknowledge um, Richard Makarski, who probably many of you know in the front row here, who's my research collaborator extraordinaire. And um, so as much of the um, work I'll talk about today, uh, that's the more research-based stuff, um, you will see that, that Richard's been deeply um, involved in that as well. So let me go find my coffee cup here. All right. so. Um, as, as we go through things today, um, if there's a quick question or clarification or something, just raise your hand and we can do that to kind of stay on track and not go too far afield. Um, I'll 
save longer questions um, to the end, but if, if it's just a quick clarification, um, let me know. Um, uh, I will probably typically repeat it back um, if when you're asking something you would prefer that not to happen because of the line of stream, because I know there's folks who may be concerned about their being public here. Um, just let me know that and I won't repeat back. So, um, or come ask me afterwards, so it's also fine. All right, so um, different versions of this um, presentation I've done in, in different kinds of settings, and there, there's kind of two versions of it. Um, this is the title that I usually use when I'm presenting more um, to the community. Um, and then there's another version that is more the presentation to providers. So um, I think I'll ask you in a little bit who, who you all are. I think we have a mi mixed group today, so I'm going to cycle back and forth between those a little bit. So sometimes you'll hear the language directed a bit more um, towards providers and, and sometimes more um, towards community. So um, I have no conflicts of interest um, to report related to this. So I want to get a little bit of sense of, of who's here and um, also tell you just a little bit um, more about me. So um, as Don mentioned, I've been at UNL on the faculty um, since I finished graduate school. Um, so I do a lot of teaching um, around provision of services. I do a lot of clinical supervision, but I also have a small private practice uh, that runs through our clinic. And the main reason I do that is I just think that if I'm going to be a researcher uh, working on issues around um, therapy, I, I need to keep my hand in a little bit. So I see like three, four clients a week, which is for those of you who are full-time practitioners, you're like, well, that's like what I do before lunch on Thursday. Um, but uh, it kind of keeps my hand in a little bit. And, and, and so hopefully it kind of helps inform um, what I do. So um, I uh, let me find out who's, who's out here. How many people are providers or students who are going to be providers one way or the other? All right. How many people um, are um, UNK students, but not in the sort of going to be therapists? Okay. And how about folks from the community who are here, just Carney and around? Okay. All right. Good. Nice mix. All right. So, um, I, as you saw in the first slide, my, the pronouns I use are um, she, her, hers. Um, I identify um, as a, a cisgender queer woman. Um, so as we go through and I hear some of the language and some of the perspectives, um, you kind of know where, where I'm coming from. And I definitely welcome you calling me out um, on language and such if um, I'm not matching your, your identities or, or how you see your community here. I think I know a little bit about the Carney community, but certainly not as much as you all. So LGBTQ issues have been in the media a lot in recent years, and I have a few examples of that. Um, you know, Caitlyn Jenner's very public um, gender affirmation um, shows what a lot of media attention in a really well-financed um, affirmation process can be. Um, it, that that's not either desired or acceptable or accessible to um, all uh, people who wish to make a gender um, transition, and it really, really hides the. Um, these beautiful images really hide the reality for um, many trans women, especially trans women of color, um, who are at risk for violence and, and have much different outcomes. But I think it's important to acknowledge that the larger community, when they think transgender women, they think Caitlyn Jenner, and that's a that's a pretty narrow narrow picture. This is from a few years ago. Um, one of the first. Uh, uh, athletes in a major sport um, to come out. Uh, Jason Collins, you see uh, the cover of Sports Illustrated here. This is from 2014. Another sports figure, Michael Sam, drafted into the NFL, and there was this was all over the place that he kissed his boyfriend um, when finding out that he was being drafted in the NFL, and kind of that celebration, and there was a lot of attention to that at the time. 
Um, there's, I think, some question about whether that interfered with his ability to have a successful football career or not. Um, but we'll leave that conversation to another day and an, another set of experts. Chaz Bono, another very public um, transition that some of you uh, may know about. When we look at um, the celebrations for marriage equality, on June 26, 2015, um, for uh, many of us in the community, we remember where we were. We remember what was happening, just like people remember where they were when, when JFK was shot or when 9-11, um, how we heard about 9-11, those kinds of things. This is a watershed moment. Um, and I think at the time, um, we thought, well, well this is it. Um, although, um, as, as we've found since then, there are still many ongoing issues around um, equality. So certainly it's a landmark decision, um, but it didn't solve everything. But it was a terrific day. And now a more recent image from just the last few days. This is the um, lead of the story in the Chicago Tribune. Um, Pete Buttigieg did what most political candidates do when he announced his candidacy for public office on Sunday. He brought his spouse on stage for a loving embrace, a quick kiss, and a traditional photo op. And if we think back even five years ago, it's hard to imagine um, a president, a, a fairly mainstream candidate for the presidency um, doing this. Now, how well that goes remains to be seen, how accepted he is for being gay versus a wide variety of his political issues certainly um, remains to be seen. But it is a, a moment at which it was not the kiss of death, no pun intended, of his campaign. So, so these things are swirling around in the media. We're going to talk today about a number of topics. I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology. We're going to talk about kind of health in the communities, LGBTQ communities. We're going to talk about some overall kind of clinical competencies, um, talk a little bit about how to think about gender identity and sexual orientation in um, case formulation. We're not going to go very deeply in the weeds on that today, though. Um, talk about some assessment and treatment considerations. And then I've got one slide at the end, just a little bit about uh, making your practice LGBTQ friendly and kind of issues around um, marketing a little bit. So, all right. So I think I am probably preaching to the choir here. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, so LGBTQA, what do the letters mean? Um, I just don't think I need to know that. I'm looking around this crowd. I don't need, do I need to do this? No, everybody knows this. Okay, all right. So usually when I do this um, presentation, I also um, give an opportunity for people to ask questions, like the question you always want to know, like can I use this term or that term or something. Um, I'm not going to do that here because A, I don't A, I don't think I need to, and B, the term you ask about might be really stigmatizing to the person sitting next to you. So we're going to just slide over that. If you have a question about something, come talk to me or any of the conference organizers afterwards and they can help you. All right, so let's talk about um, mental health in the LGBTQ community. Um, being a sexual minority um, is a risk factor for um, anxiety disorders, for depression, um, for suicide attempts, suicidality in general, um, and for substance abuse. Uh, there are fewer studies um, for individuals who identify as transgender and gender diverse, um, but uh, there seems to be a similar or even um, heightened risk. We know that uh, folks in these communities are more likely to seek psychotherapy than heterosexual and cisgender um, uh, people. And one of the questions that's been asked over time um, is this something that's inherent about being gay or transgender and gender diverse, TGD, um, or is it something else? And we're going to spend some time on that. But before I do that, 
I want to make a really clear message that whenever we talk about these health disparities, people quickly kind of overgeneralize and, and kind of assume that the whole community is, as, as our collaborator Nathan Woodruff says, um, they assume that everybody is, is sick and drunk and um, suicidal and that, and that, that just is not true. A heightened risk means that it's more people than the straight or cisgender community, but it's not everybody by any means. So just as we go through this, um, please keep that in mind. So the question that's been asked about where these health disparities come from is, is it something associated with being gay or trans um, that makes it more likely um, that you'll have one of these um, mental health problems? And um, I like to talk about this um, history a little bit because Evelyn Hooker, who was born in North Platte, Nebraska, just down the road, um, was a major player in starting this shift from pathologizing sexual orientation and gender identity um, to um, closer to where we are today. And um, so uh, if, if you don't know much about Evelyn Hooker, um, this is one place where I think the Wikipedia article is great, so I'll refer you to that. Um, but Evelyn Hooker was a, a clinical psychologist um, who in the 1950s, um, I believe it was a graduate student, a gay male graduate student, came to her and said, you know, not all gay people are mentally ill. And she was like, what? Of course they are, because that's what everybody thought. And they said, no, I actually know a whole bunch of people who were in thriving communities, and, you know, that what we what's in the research literature is not accurate. And that launched her into a series of, of very important studies um, that she did in just the most clever way um, to demonstrate that, yes, indeed, there are lots of healthy folks in these communities. Um, so long story short, she took the very best psychological assessments at the time, which at that time was like the Rorschach and the TAT, some things that we wouldn't necessarily give today. Um, but she gave them to um, first gay men and then straight men. And then she got the people who, who had created the tests, who know the most about them, to like sort out who was gay and straight. And it was no better than chance. They couldn't do it. So it was very powerful evidence um, that we needed to change how we think about that. So Evelyn Hooker, one of my, my uh, scientific heroes from North Platte, Nebraska. So if it's not something inherent um, in uh, folks' identity, um, we think what's going on, and again, probably this isn't news to most of you, we think that it has to do with the, the stresses of marginalization. It's often called the minority stress model. But again, you'll hear me re refer frequently to um, Nathan Woodruff, who's our community partner. Um, in our research group, Trans Collaborations. Um, and he's really pushed back on that and said, it's not about the people, it's not about the minority, it's about the process. So we're starting to call it marginalization stress. So you'll hear me say that, um, but it's the it's this this model that um, uh, Elon Meyer started in 2003. We'll note that he was at Lincoln and my research group was lucky enough to have lunch with him and we presented this idea to him and he wasn't that excited about it. So, um, given that his whole career has been built around this model, I guess, you know, these young upstarts who say, hey, you need a new name, maybe it didn't go so well. So, so the minority stress model or the marginalization stress model suggests that um, uh, folks in the LGBTQ community um, have what, are, what uh, Meyer calls these kind of distal stressors. So hearing about discrimination, hate crimes, things that are kind of out in the milieu but maybe not affecting you directly. Um, there are proximal stressors, which are things that are affecting you directly. The one we're going to talk the most about today is um, outness. Um, the, um, we could also talk about internalized homophobia or internalized transphobia. I'm not going to spend as much time on that today. But those are things more specific to the person. And that these add up on top of the general life stressors we all have. And we know that stress is related to health and mental health. So it's kind of the cumulative effects of all of these. But they can be buffered by your coping strategies and your social support and your connection to the community um, so that even if you have lots of stress, if you have really good coping and social support, you might be okay. If you have lots of stress and no coping and social support, you're probably going to have poor outcomes. 
Okay, so we're going to return to this model a few times today um, just to kind of help you keep um, organized about where we are. Remember, we're talking about the marginalization process is the issue, not people's identity. So let's think about some general principles here about being um, a culturally competent provider um, to the LGBTQA community. And I'm going to kind of um, summarize these and we'll go into detail a little bit on some of them. So the first one um, is kind of, I, I'm not sure who said this, it shows up in every talk I've ever been to on this topic. Um, everything is about being gay or trans and nothing is about being gay or trans. What's that mean? Um, it means that um, you have to, to look at the individual. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We're also going to talk about another general principle is knowing your community, um, how to enhance coping and support, um, and addressing both distal and proximal stressors using that model we talked about. Okay. All right. Oops. So for individuals who identify as part of the LGBTQ community, um, their identity is always important, and it's and it's important um, is an important contextual variable. It's important in understanding um, yourself and understanding your life. Um, but sometimes clients come in uh, because they're anxious, or they're depressed, or they're going through a divorce, or um, they just got a diagnosis of a chronic illness, um, and that's really the the focus of treatment. It's not about their identity. So it's it's really important to kind of get a good sense of um, what it is people are seeking help for and always remember that those things might play out differently because of our identity and you need to keep that in mind um, but that it's not um, not always the whole ball game in some of the research we've done we've asked um, folks in the transgender and gender diverse community about their experiences in in healthcare settings um, not just mental health but healthcare as well and one of the um, one of the folks recounted um, having the um, trans broken leg. Like they had a broken leg, they went to the ER, but it was all about their identity. And I'm sorry, but the broken leg is the broken leg. The identity probably isn't, isn't the key thing here. So, um, uh, so keeping those things um, distinct, I think is useful. The second kind of general um, principle it's kind of knowing your community um, and the social context. So if you're going to work with these communities, um, you really need to have a, a, some sense about where the safe spaces are. Um, is there a PFLAG? How active is it? Um, what, are, what are the safe religious communities? There's often welcoming congregations, um, uh, bars, bookstores, whatever it is in the local community. Um, also knowing about safe employers, um, which employers um, tend to um, be more affirming and more accepting, which employers have health care coverage that covers um, um, gender affirmation surgery for trans folks. So um, it's important to know can have some familiarity with that. Um, often folks will come to you and they'll already be connected to some of those resources, but often part of the reason they're having problems is they're, they don't have that community support and um, being able to connect to this important outcome. Knowing the, the legal context um, is very um, important as well. So uh, often when I'm giving this talk, I'm you know, I've done this webinar, or I've done it in, in a very blue state, and people are like, oh, everybody has employment and housing protections. And I'm like, no. Um, I'm sure I'm not telling this audience anything when I say, you know, your employer could look at you and say, um, you're gay, I don't like you, you're gone. And there is no legal repercussion for that. Now, they don't usually do that. They say, oh, we're moving in a different direction. Oh, you don't quite have the flexibility we need on ours. Um, but those, the lack of those um, protections is really crucial. Um, for the community. So some organizations have policies um, which are helpful, but once you get outside of, of those um, often larger organizations, it can, it can be an issue. 
Also, um, if you're going to work with a transgender and gender diverse community, um, knowing um, the requirements in the state for um, changing gender um, markers and, and that sort of thing um, are important to know. And those are pretty specific. Um, in Lincoln at one time, the word was, go to the DMV on this day and go to this clerk because they won't hassle you. Anybody else will hassle you, but go to this person. So, so knowing those specifics um, can be really, really helpful. Um, wh what's it like in Kearney? Can you go to the D DMV and get your gender marker changed without much hassle? Anybody know? Yes? No? Hastings is fine? Okay. So just depends. Depends on local context. Um, also, the terminology that the communities use for themselves and stuff varies a bit. Um, from place to place, so having some awareness of that and just kind of overall um, climate. And again, there's like little pockets, like the universities often tend to be a bit safer. Um, other um, parts of town may be different. All right. Yes. Okay. Right, right. Right, right. I think that thing, so I'll just repeat it back just a little bit the, um, for the streaming. The, um, that cultural context, including like current political environment, including very immediate clinical, political environment, um, is very important to have some familiarity with, um, to pay attention to the news. Um, people often say, oh, what should I look at besides mainstream media? Um, Huffington Post, gay voices, trans voices, um, they have some columns that'll be things that are showing up on Facebook feeds that are not yours if you're not a member of the community. Um, so uh, I think those things are important to pay attention to. When I went through the slides earlier where I showed, you know, Caitlyn Jenner and some of that stuff, um, there's a whole bunch of really negative stuff, right? I could put up there too, like, oh, this terrible thing has happened, this terrible thing has happened. I didn't do that because that's marginalizing to see that. I don't need to be confronted with that. Many of you don't want to be confronted with that more often than you are. But if you're a provider, um, you do need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Okay, see. Well, that's true. Yeah, Kate, Caitlin Jenner is is very divisive in, for trans women, and um, yeah, you're right. I should rethink that. I should rethink that. Thank you. Oh, the comment was that um, I said I didn't put up things that were going to create marginalization experiences, and so he's pointing out um, Caitlyn Jenner does that for trans women. Yeah, and I know, I know better. I, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and and of, of lots of folks who aren't as familiar with the community are like, oh, it's a great national role model and all of this. And like, no, that's not, not the experience of the community. So, so being aware of, of how messages are viewed um, by people in the community, not just through straight cisgender eyes, are, is really important for therapy. All right. So remember we said that part of dealing with this marginalization is uh, kind of helping people develop coping and social support. And this is something people often can do for themselves, but certainly um, is part of any sort of therapeutic context. So even with a lot of stressors, people can really thrive if they have sufficient coping skills social support. And for the therapists in the room, uh, most of this is not anything brand new. This is all the stuff you do with everybody you see, like good, healthy lifestyle things, diet and sleep and exercise, um, expressing 
um, negative feelings as opposed to just sitting on them and tamping them down um, in an appropriate manner, some sort of cognitive self-help skills like avoiding catastrophizing about things that might happen in the future and trying to look at like what's the evidence for what's really happening now, um, just all those things that I do. These days, lots of people are doing some mindfulness as part of that. I think there's good evidence for that as well. Something um, people can explore. There's all sorts of great apps and stuff. It's easy to explore on your own. Um, so all of those things are a really important part of working um, with this community, as they are with working with any anybody. You know, it's sort of good things for human beings. Um, regardless of how they identify um, across a variety of identities. If we look at some more specific um, coping strategies for this community, though, um, let's go to these up here. So, one of the one of the things that's um, I think can be challenging for therapists is kind of recognizing. Um, when bias and discrimination um, might be happening and helping clients have strategies to deal with it. So sometimes um, your clients are very aware of when they've been marginalized, but sometimes um, they've been so kind of marginalized that they're just like, well, you know, I just, I just think that person doesn't really like me or something, or, you know, maybe they were having a bad day or whatever. They can kind of discount it. So recognizing um, what's happening and then um, helping people figure out what they're going to do about it. Now, I will um, take a little cul-de-sac here because one of the reactions to those of us who are providers who see ourselves as having this like strong social justice um, orientation is to be outraged like oh my gosh I can't believe they do that or like aren't you going to file a lawsuit what you know you got to do so and we have all this outrage and there's a lot of privilege that comes with that um, lots of folks living in the community they don't have the space that they get to be that outraged about that because they're this is going to have big impacts on their lives so so make sure that we're paying attention to our own privilege and reactions um, and helping um, the client understand what their experience is. Um, certainly giving feedback like that sounds like that was really unfair um, or more outraged if that's where the client is. But, but, um, being, but a big reaction from the therapist isn't always the most helpful thing. So what are the possible strategies? One is to help people choose when to confront it or not in the moment, practicing assertiveness skills or any skills we would use for, um, you know, interpersonal conflict that, that we might teach. We could help people learn to do that. But we have to be very clear that um, it's often not a good idea to confront it. Um, you may be facing a lot of marginalization at work, but if you lose this job, you're not going to get another job and you're going to be homeless. So, you know... You, you may not get to confront it. So helping clients negotiate that. Um, over time, though, I'm often working with clients on a more long-term goal about trying to get themselves into more accepting environments, kind of choosing where they live, choosing where they work, as best they can, depending on their resources, moving to another another place that's going to be safer and healthier. Um, and this kind of comes with, you know, balancing priorities. So I worked with somebody who has a, who's a professional who works at this kind of fairly elite firm, um, but it's incredibly marginalizing. Like, but this is a great job. There's all these professional opportunities. I'm like, yeah, but it's kind of killing you because of the way you get treated because you can't be out. Um, and so kind of helping people figure out, like, What's the balance over the long haul um, that I want? So, um, so realizing that not always that we can confront things, but that a little more long-term goal to get people, help people get into a healthier environment um, would be what we'd like to do. And that can be greater or lesser extent, depending on people's resources. Another um, strategy 
specific to the community is to distinguish between emotional responses that are distorted versus realistic perceptions. So one of the things that we often do as therapists when people say something like, oh, you know, my boss is going to fire me and I won't be able to get another job. Um, the first thing we want to do is like, oh, that sounds kind of irrational. Let's let's check it. Like, really? Is that true? We start challenging it. Um, and when you're working with folks from any marginalized group, um, recognizing um, that you don't want to be challenging their experiences of marginalization. So it may well be that if people get fired, they're not going to be able to find another job, and that's not irrational. Now, the privileged, um, white, cisgender, uh, well-educated man who says that, you're like, really? You know, it seems likely that you'll be able to get another job in Nebraska. Um, so you can really go after that. But for other communities, and this is true for working with people of color and a variety of groups, to really um, step back and, and kind of look at um, what's realistic. And, and if, the, if they trust their perceptions, they know their situation, they know their lives, um, and keeping in mind kind of laws and community standards um, to help people negotiate those. That pause. Sometimes people have questions on that one. Any? So continuing on thinking about social support, there's a ton of research that shows that LGBTQ people get less social support from their families um, than heterosexual or cisgender um, folks. Social support is so important um, in protecting us from anxiety and depression and health problems and substance abuse. Um, so it's really important to help people, as I mentioned, create a supportive community around them. And I have just a few um, suggestions here. Um, as you get into more rural spaces, fewer of these are available. There's no question about that. Um, so we may re need to really be focusing on long online support. Um, but in even some of the smallest communities, um, there might be at least a small group um, that people could connect to. Um, and people often really quickly dismiss religious communities because this sort of cultural narrative is that religion is anti-LGBT. Um, uh, that, that's not true across the board. Um, Pete Buttigieg actually is talking a lot about that. Um, he was a very religious person and saying, um, you know, this is part of who I am. The um, other thing to think about, like other community organizations, people often say, what do you mean by that? And I say, think about something um, like some environmental group or something or some group working on climate change. Probably not LGBT specific, LGBTQ specific, but probably some folks interested in social justice who may be welcoming. Yes. Find your local leftist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, okay. Cool. So this is about out Nebraska coming to Grand Island, um, and it sounds like we have somebody who knows about it that you could see here if you're interested in that. Yes. I saw another hand up over here. Okay, if you think of it later, wave me down. All right. Okay, so we've kind of talked about that um, coping and social support part of this. I'm looking a little bit more at um, kind of some of the distal stressors, and we're going to talk about um, uh, some of the proximal stressors after that. So the general environment is presenting um, a, a stress for LGBTQ community. Um, it has to do with this idea that um, there's sort of a stigma attached 
to being a member of the community, which you could think of a stigma as kind of a, um, a sort of something that's like a stain or society kind of agrees that this group is inferior in some way. Um, and even with progress, I would argue that that still um, is occurring um, for this community. And that takes a toll over time um, to be associated um, have your uh, be part of your identity, and even all of the, those of us who are in a community sometimes tend to um, internalize this and can buy into it a little bit. Um, even though in our head we could say, "Oh, that's not right," but can can buy into that and feel a little bit of, of shame or inferiority. Let's do a little um, little experiment here. So, take a look at this image, just a random image I pulled off the internet. Um, and as you look at that, think about what words come to mind, what you think about it, what you see there. So some of you may be thinking, oh, what a warm, lovely, friendly couple. Maybe if it's close to your anniversary, you're like, oh, I remember when we were like that, you know, whatever. I come up, if you're recently, you're divorced, you're probably like, yeah, love, forget it. Okay. So you got your impressions of that? All right. Do you feel the same about this image? Some of you might feel better. What comes to your mind with this image? This is a close-up of the Michael Sam image earlier. So most people feel somewhat different about this image, even if you don't like think it's overtly bad or wrong. Um, does it seem like a little risky, maybe? Um, if you're on the faculty at the university, would you hesitate to show that in one of your classes or worry about backlash? Um, I would. I teach psychodiversity and I'd be nervous about showing it. Um, how would you feel if your five-year-old walked in the room and said, oh, what's that? Why are two men kissing? Would that be okay or not? What if it's the neighbor's five-year-old? What if it's your pastor? So many people are like, that's a great image. I'm totally comfortable with that. But many people, even if you are generally feel um, comfortable with the community, have just a slightly different feel. And if you don't, that's great. If you feel more positive, that's great. But that any difference there is that sort of internalization of society stigma that somehow this is different than the image that preceded. So I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat that back a little bit for the streaming. So it's a really important point that if you seek out support um, from a sort of liberal group, thinking that they're gonna be more safe, you're not somehow looking for the stamp of approval of cisgender straight people to say you're okay. What you're looking for is a place where you can be yourself and be out, and maybe later have some allies um, when you need them. I I really do want to say though that we. It's really easy for us to say that, you know, all conservative people are anti-gay. Um, and, and I understand why people think that. But I think thinking about this in terms of um, who's safe and who gets me, regardless of what label you're putting on it, is important. Mm-hmm. What? So, right. So the the point that's being made is that um, part of the conservative ideals is to support a cisgender um, heterosexual, huh? Is to is to support the patriarchy that that leads to all of these things. I agree. I agree. I agree with that in general. I just think when you're looking at specific individuals. Um, 
having a bit more flexibility might make sense. But you got to do what feels good and what feels safe to you. Somebody fanning themselves or asking a question? Okay. It is warm in here. So, all right. So I'm going to jump us ahead here. So how do you help your client deal with these things? So one of the really important things I think, and, and I think this, I feel this way for my for myself, just as a um, kind of dealing with the news and the world. Um, sometimes you just really need to limit exposure. Sometimes you need to get off Instagram and Facebook and CNN and whatever else you're on, um, because um, just hearing this stuff over and over and over again, um, the latest outrage is really takes a toll on your soul. And so um, surrounding yourself with people who disagree with the stigma and limiting your exposure to some of the media um, stuff. Another thing that often people will undertake is to kind of work for change. So empowerment can be a really good anecdote um, to stigma. So people will get involved in activism and stuff. And that um, that can be very helpful for, for folks. Um, it does come with a cost, though, because it takes a lot of energy. It means that you're probably confronting and facing a lot more stigma than you would otherwise. You're having a lot more marginalizing experiences. Um, and um, that... That's a cost, but for some people, that balance, at least in some parts of their life or some portion of their life, makes sense. So, so you can't not live in the place that we live right now. Although I suppose if you move to Sweden or something, people choose to do that. But um, if you you can limit how much it impacts you to some extent. All right, I'm going to um, shift to talking a little bit about outness now. So, um, and this kind of has uh, a couple of parts to it. And this, uh, we tend to think of this around being gay, um, but it also can involve gender identity as well. That plays out somewhat differently there. So disclosure is kind of actively indicating your sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, I disclosed earlier, I said I'm a cisgender, um, queer woman, something along those lines. Um, concealment is kind of not just not saying anything, but actively hiding. Um, so uh, if, you know, it means that, um, so if I were um, a trans woman and I were wearing um, the buttons that said she, her, hers, um, you know, I'd kind of be coming out in that way. But if my but my my but my pronouns really are they them, and I'm not wearing them, but I'm doing this other thing that seems safer, that's more. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that would be more concealment. So we'll see some other examples of that. So researchers typically use these um, interchangeably. And we're going to talk about how they might be different. But first, let's look at some. Um, costs and benefits. So being out, everybody's like, oh, everybody should be out. Well, you a greater risk of bullying, greater risk of hate crimes, greater risk of rejection, losing your job, your housing, status, um, all sorts of opportunities. There definitely are risks with being out. There are benefits to being out as well. The research shows that um, there's you have decreased anxiety, depression, and stress if you're more out. And the asterisk there is because um, in the last like, 10 to 15 years, that has flipped. It used to be people who were more out were more anxious and depressed, um, but that has now flipped, so being out is the healthier choice. You have more access to social support because you can people recognize your identity, you find similar people. Um, it's helpful for your physical health. And um, it's also helpful about changing public attitudes about LGBTQ people. So one of the, the kind of national priorities for some of the um, gay civil rights organizations has been to have like National Coming Out Day and stuff because if you know somebody personally who's a member of the community, you tend to be less biased. So the more people that come out, the more influence. That. Now, that's not to say there is a cost for you personally, but there is a greater social good. Outness is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing process. Coming out to yourself, understanding who you are, 
coming out to each new person, each new situation. Um, so let's look a little bit more at concealment. So as I said, concealment is the act of hiding. So concealment is when um, your coworker says to you, oh, what'd you do this weekend? And you say, oh, I, um, I went to the movies. And really, I went to the movies with my new girlfriend. And I just, I don't say that. Or I say, oh, I went to the movies on a date. And they say, oh, what's his name? And you go, oh, it's, it's this, this person I just met. Like you're kind of, kind of lying, kind of not saying. Um, for families, concealment is when um, you say, oh, my son and his friend came to Easter dinner with us, as opposed to my son and his spouse or his boyfriend came to Easter dinner. So that sort of um, having to hide um, turns out has, uh, so the bond there, it says, isn't it better to conceal a stigma if you can? Turns out the answer is no. There are really um, high costs for concealment because it impacts how you think and feel and act in so many situations. Who knows? What if they find out? Um, it's, it's sort of like we, a lot of us as parents told our kids, if you tell the truth, it's easy to remember. If you tell a lie, you got to remember like what's happening um, and who you told and what they know and keep your story straight. It's not so hard to keep the truth straight. It creates kind of a constant monitoring of yourself. Am I acting straight? I have to be careful about public displays of affection. Um, that sort of monitoring takes a psychological toll. There's some good research evidence to support all of this. And it also may limit the situations you um, enter. It may limit your social relationships. It may limit interpersonal intimacy. It may limit the social support you can achieve. Um, it may limit sort of success at work or academics. Um, you know, maybe I can't go to that school because I'd, I'd be out or I can't, take that, I can't take that women's lit class because people might figure out I'm trans and that would be so hard. So your opportunity to engage in things um, is limited. And John Pachenkas has done a bunch of terrific work. Yeah. So the question is, um, in this research, is it all done in New York City, where we know John Pajankas does his work, um, or does it really look like what's happening in the state, and does that matter? Um, there's lots of different bodies of research, so I don't know the exact answer to this question, but there's lots of different studies in different ways, some with some of the larger national samples that suggest that being out is better, or not, not concealing. And there's also a lot of psychological theory that's so um, we looked at this a little bit. One of my students, um, Pete Meidlinger, who if anybody's from Grand Island um, may know Dr. Meidlinger, his dad was a longtime psychologist there, and his son is now a psychologist. Um, and Pete developed a, an online survey that separated concealment and um, disclosure. So we called it the Nebraska Outness Scale, and we separated these out. We collected data from... 150 folks, gay and lesbian. This is just gay and lesbian, not trans. Um, and we found that greater concealment was associated with poorer quality of life, greater fear of negative evaluation, um, which is related to social anxiety, and less social support. There's some of those relationships with disclosure, but concealment clearly was killing, carrying the day in terms of the mental health um, outcomes. So concealment is the problem. So implications. It's a client's choice about whether they're being out, but helping them accurately weigh the costs and benefits. Um, staying in the closet, it gets like dark and nasty in there after a while. Um, most clients are better off if they can move towards a life where they can be authentic, but you obviously have to look at people's individual situations. 
All right, I'm going to talk about a few other clinical issues now that are more specific um, to being uh, transgender. Let's jump down here. And again, some I think I'm speaking to the, the choir here, so I'm going to not spend much time about this. And I, Dawn, you're doing all this this afternoon, so I can just say, this slide should say, go see Dawn later, because Dawn will talk about all of this. Um, <clears throat> So one thing I will comment on is, is there's a bit, bit of controversy about the gender dysphoria diagnosis um, in DSM and whether there should not even be a mental health diagnosis and such. Um, so I would just, for the clinicians in the room, I would caution, if you're thinking about giving that diagnosis, to read up on it, think about it, think about the implications. Um, there's some, if you, if you do a little bit of search online, you'll find some stuff about it. Um, sometimes it is necessary to have the diagnosis for Gender affirmation related services, um, probably you don't need the diagnosis in there. If somebody's coming to see you for anxiety and depression, think about the implications of it later. Um, what we, when we write letters for people for uh, medical affirmation, we say um, <clears throat> we don't believe in giving the diagnosis. This person would meet the criteria if somebody were to give the diagnosis, this is what's going on, but we don't give a stigmatizing diagnosis. Most times that flies. Sometimes the surgeon writes back and says, if you don't give the diagnosis, I'm not doing it. So we give the diagnosis, but um, we try to work around that if we can. Quick question? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the issues about aging and the community is is a big one because very often you're losing control in some ways over your life. You have to live in a facility, and is it going to be safe? Do you have to go back to the closet? This is a huge issue for the trans community as well. Um, one of the biographies I read about somebody who transitioned who said, I had bottom surgery only because I didn't want questions when I'm 80 and in the nursing home. Like, <laughs> they just thought, you know, just kind of planted head. Now, maybe that's not the only reason. But, yeah, those are big, those are big things. Um, and anybody, students who are doing research, people who are providing services around that, that is a much needed area. All right. Um... One thing I will say is we have some um, research that shows that when you're developing your forms for your practice for gender, leave a blank if you can. So people can just write it in. Don't try to guess which boxes you should have. Um, that's probably the most affirmative thing. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of our research products here. <clears throat> Um, so one of the things that um, clinicians often do is they do some sort of progress monitoring um, to see how people are doing over time. So uh, probably lots of people have given the back depression inventory, often used in cognitive therapy, other therapies for depression. You kind of track symptoms over time. Turns out that there wasn't really anything like this for transgender, gender diverse folks that covered the things that we needed covered like how out you are, how comfortable you are with your body, um, how you, what experiences of marginalization you're having, how well you feel like you're coping, are you being able to live your authentic self. And so um, we worked with the community, um, both the TGD community in Nebraska and surrounding states, as well as providers that they identified as being affirming, and developed the Trans Collaborations um, Clinical Check-In, TC3. Um, it's an 18 item uh, measure, it's easily scored, but like before the session, it doesn't make any assumptions about gender binary. Um, this is going to be, in the next day or two, the measure will be up on our website, and I'll show you the website address in just a minute, um, but I urge any of the clinicians to um, go find it and download it um, and see if you find it useful. We did a validity study. Um, for it, and the, the paper will be up in the same couple of days. It's just accepted for publication. 215 um, transgender, gender, diverse folks online, 
Now, the third, a third, a third, as we often get in our research, um, is mostly a European American, um, but a fairly broad um, age range uh, mix of gender, of uh, sexual orientations. So they completed, I won't spend too much time on the science here, but they completed the TC3 and some other measures of health and well-being, as well as some TGD-specific measures. There's a minority stress and resilience scale, and then this reflection and rumination scale that were developed by um, researchers to, for specifically for the community. But they're too specific and too long to give um, in a setting, clinical practice setting. So... <clears throat> Um, higher scores on the TC3 are better, healthier, so um, there's some common measures some of you might recognize here. The PHQ-9, probably many of you have done it at your doctor's office these days. When you checked into the doctor, you got nine items that says, um, are you having trouble sleeping? How's your appetite? Da -da. It's being used widely in primary care. <laughs> JD7 is an anxiety measure. Um, positive and negative affect, and then satisfaction with life. And you can see the TC3 correlates in the direction that we would hope higher scores associated with um, lower depression, lower anxiety, lower negative affect, higher positive affect, higher satisfaction. Um, similar nice effects for the um, trans specific um, measures. So it looks like we have something that's picking up kind of on overall well being um, that seems to relate to other things in the way it should. So, as I mentioned, the um, TC3 will be on, it says on our website. It will be there probably by the weekend. Um, Go.unl.edu slash transcollaborations is our research team. All our research products are there. Um, and there's the citation. I will um, pause if anybody wants to grab a photo of that to have the uh, web address, but it's free. All right, um, let's just jump to the marketing here. So uh, we will continue to be putting up tools from trans collaborations for working with uh, transgender, uh, gender diverse folks. All of our stuff is really oriented in this part of the country, um, sensitive to the needs of this community, developed in partnership with the TGD communities. Our stuff is adult oriented for now, um, but is a, a resource um, for therapists and then for um, trans folks who might be thinking about seeking services to walk in and say, hey, you should look at this. Um, and hopefully you'll say these people know what they're doing or you should look at this and don't do this because that doesn't fit me, but hopefully it's more for me. All right, so one of the um, things that came out of a lot of the interviews and stuff we've done is that um, the... Um, Therapists are like, I really want to serve this community. How do I let them know that I'm friendly? Um, show up at events, be an active member. You can't just do this and stay in your office. You've got to be connected into the broader community. Have a non-discrimination statement on your website. Something like all sexual orientations and gender expressions are welcome. Um, you cannot ask just to be on some organization's membership list without kind of earning it. You can't just join so they'll give you referrals. Um, that's seen as pretty negatively by communities. All right, I see we're running down on time here. Let's get to our take-home messages. Um, the stressors that come with identifying as LGBTQA create risk for anxiety and depression. Clients can reduce those risks with good coping strategies, gathering strong social support, and being out in a healthy and safe way. As therapists, we need to recognize that we've internalized stigma and actively work to not stigmatize our LGBTQA clients. Back to how you felt about that second kissing photo. Um, and we build trust with the community communities um, by participating in their activities. So I'd like to say thank you to a bunch of current and former students, um, to my research collaborator, Richard Murkowski, um, and the researchers whose work I cited most here, Greg Herrick, Rich Savin-Williams, John Pachenkas, and Alon Meyer. And I'd really like to thank folks at UNK um, for hosting today. We have just a couple of minutes probably for questions, but I'll hang around a little bit too if people want to talk. Oh. 
Okay, I should say something about Camp Bold. Um, go to uh, go to Trans Collaborations website. We are our community board is hosting a family camp for trans kids, age six to fifteen, I think. Um, so see Richard, see me if you know a family that might be interested. And it, there is no charge to the participants. The costs are covered. A question in the back. Uh, thank you. This was um, very, very informative and interesting. Back to your uh, slide about destigmatization and um, the pictures that you showed and you asked us how we feel about it. I just wanted to make a comment. My daughter was raised in Canada, in Montreal specifically, and in Quebec after the Tronco Revolution in 74, uh, the policies changed into extreme inclusiveness. And um, part of the school and daycare education includes that inclusiveness in mm -hmm. all f forms of diversity, including um, the um, um, LGBTQ groups. Um, she is 16 now, and when we have conversations, uh, it is just a norm to her. She doesn't see any difference between the two pictures that you just showed us. I grew up in a society where it was a taboo, and obviously it seems different to me. I, ha I have a very open mind, I am an inclusive person, but it is still is there. So my comment is that probably the best way to go around it is to uh, go for education with early childhood and childhood. That I think would be the only way to really destigmatize yeah. de stigmatize everything. No, I mean, I think that that is true, and I think that, I mean, certainly it depends on schools and stuff. Like, I have a, a sophomore in high school, and um, she said to me once, you know, I don't think hardly anybody in my class is really straight besides me. Everybody's at least bi. It's like, it doesn't really matter, you know? And she, when she was about six, she came out as straight, which we thought was kind of fun. I said, well, you, she's like, can I grow up and marry a boy? And I said, yeah, that's fine if that's what you want to do when you get there. And she's like, I think it is. So, okay. You know, so, yeah, it's, it's, there are generational differences. Just go ahead and get my um, back when you were, the slide about concealment, when you were talking about an example of, um, you know, saying my son and his friend or that mm -hmm. type of a thing. Uh -huh. I've been in a situation before where someone I love said, you are not to out anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is a person, I've been stuck, like, trying to make it easier, but then, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to do that. Right. So you kind of don't it's, know what to do it's, sometimes. But it's their info. So it's their identity, and they get to make that choice. So that's a good point. I should mention that when I do that, that you shouldn't be saying my son and his boyfriend when your son's not out to anybody, and they're going to be seeking a job from the person you're talking to next summer. Right. So, yeah. So you do need to respect um, people's stuff. It's, it's more common that the, the parents are going through some out becoming out process, becoming out as parent as of a gay person or a trans person. But yeah, no, you do need to respect that. Y'all are like giving me all the caveats I need to add. Thank you very much. Uh, the people in the folk in the back who are going to tell us when we need to stop, just be assertive when that needs to happen. But I'll take questions until I get kicked out. Okay? Maybe we're done? All right, I do have... Um, some uh, business cards and some trans collaborations business cards if um, anybody has questions or want something you didn't want to ask in front of the group I'm happy to chat with you thank you so much